You have to search for a new set of rules. Red is of little use life. to the man who has betrayed his the soul. Maybe you're the protagonist in your story, but like there's a million other people. Welcome back, everybody. We are back. Paradigm Podcast. We started a new book, Beyond Order, by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Uh, we just want to give a shout out to you guys if you guys have been following up with our recent podcast episodes our social media we appreciate you and we hope you guys are going to enjoy going into this new book um we want you to uh first if you need anything check out our social links click the like subscribe um follow our instagram we're getting a lot of traction through that and we would appreciate your support and yeah we're going to get started into the book okay one more thing make sure you subscribe to the videos and the channel all right so Here's how the new book's going to work out, right? We're going to talk about a chapter a week, but instead of talking about the entire chapter as a whole, we're going to talk about topics that we feel passionate about or feel that can be informative to you guys as listeners. So if you guys want to hear more information or learn more about what Dr. Jordan B. Peterson has to offer or talks about, go pick up the book. This is it. We highly recommend it. I don't know about you guys, but I really just enjoyed the first chapter, the overture. There yeah. hasn't been a miss in it yet. I yeah. really enjoy it. It's interesting catching up with his life before, um, you know, he gets into it. Right. It's a pretty descriptive, uh, you know, um, what would you call that? Background. Yeah, ba- yeah, background of just what he was going through at the time. And yeah. It's pretty brutal. But, yeah, we're thankful for Dr. Jordan B. Peterson for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a follow-up from uh, 12 Rules of Life. Um, so that's why we're kind of like the overture is a, is a, is a good catch-up. You know what I mean? Because he did disapp- disappear for like a, a year or so. So Yeah, yep. And it's, it, it tells you about cool. that whole background of what's going on. So it was really good. Go pick it up. And, and we're hoping you're keeping up with us. And uh, comment down below on what you think about certain, some of these topics. Okay. Let's get it. So chapter one is titled, Do Not Carelessly Denigrate Social Institutions or Creative Judgment. Okay. So one of the topics we're going to be talking about that was introduced in this chapter is titled The Fool. So the image in the front of the chapter, did you guys take some time to look at that? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the, you're talking about the illustration, right? Yeah. yeah with the dog. Yeah. Very beginning. And the guy about to leap off the cliff. Not leap off the cliff, but he's almost about to step off of a cliff. And the, the, the title underneath that illustration, um, you know, if you guys go pick up the book, it says The Fool. Yep. Yeah, he refers to it in the, the subsection we're going to cover today. Yep. And so um, Peterson describes The Fool as a young, beautiful person, eyes lifted upward, journeying in the mountains, sun shining brightly upon them, about to carelessly step over a cliff. A cliff. Or are they? Their strength, however, is precisely in their willingness to risk such a drop to risk being once again at the bottom. Dr. Peterson also states, much that is great starts small, ignorant and useless, but today's beginner is tomorrow's master. So people think in order to become someone great, an expert or on top of a hierarchy, they need to know everything. When in fact, the best of us never stop learning and become passionately eager to understand what they do not know. In life, there is always going to be a new starting point that needs to be improved upon. A new job, graduate school. And I'll I'll open up the question to you guys. Is there a starting point that you guys can remember in your life where you had to embrace the role of being the fool? Uh, Yeah, fairly recent for me is just uh, developing a website. I mean, I went through the class before back in 2016, I think. I had my code still up on a... Um, what's it called? GitHub, where you upload it to a server. Um, and mm-hmm. I had to go back and kind of relearn everything that I learned in 2016. Okay. Um, but yeah, I had to put myself in it. It wasn't uncomfortable by no means. I was like right at in my, the comfort of my home. I wasn't in a classroom or anything, right, due to COVID. So, but outside of just what I usually do every single day or my normal routine i think that was just an additional like let's jump into something new let's jump like if it's learning in that case it was learning how to develop a website and i wanted Mm -hmm. to use it for something that's useful to me so i got i got a great benefit out of it and i I know i got a long way to go or a far way to go but i think that was a definitely a leap into the uncertain unknown um to make me feel like a beginner or the fool that uh, jbp states okay yeah, so what did yeah. the fool feel like to you being the fool? What did that 
entail for you i pity the i pole. think i think getting older <laughs> i sort of embrace that feeling once i have that feeling of uncomfortable like afraid to ask questions that's a good feeling mm. you shouldn't run from that feeling when i was younger i used to run from that feeling like oh mm. don't ask questions you're gonna like it's 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 people are gonna make fun of you you know right. what i mean you get mm-hmm. that feeling of like an- anxiety or anxiousness of um you, you oh everybody else is ahead um no one's gonna ask this stupid question but realistically yeah. how many times have we heard like there is no stupid question and i think just getting older i, I sort of embrace that uh embrace the the beginner the fool or the um lack of better term stupidity like the lack of understanding or knowing because you are educating yourself even what because it's he talks about in the book if you're going to act as if you know everything then you're inevitably moving blindly through life Mm -hmm. right thinking you know everything right Mm -hmm. so um i think it's a good feeling it's a scary feeling it's a feeling that a lot of people don't like but i think as i got older me personally i think i just started to embrace it a little bit more okay how about you david Yeah, when when was I a fool? Yeah, my whole life, you... bro. I've been a <laughs> fool, a fool since '96. Right when no. did you have to? When did you have to embrace being a fool recently? And... Yeah. Um, so, for those watching, you know, I mentioned it multiple times. I'm a graphic designer, and when I was growing up, from high school all the way up until you know college, and, and even now, in, in many ways, you know, I have to be willing to be the fool, right? And it's just the way it's described um, by JVP is is someone who is. Um, what would we say is taking risks of being humiliated, but right. But not letting that humility, um, turn into shame or something and, and, and negative. Right. And we'll talk about harnessing humility in uh, in a few moments, but, uh, I was willing to be a fool just being a graphic designer. I mean, I had to risk, you know, being humiliated in front of the classroom, making something that I thought looked cool and was designed well, but then to get critiqued really hard. And many times I had to put myself out there. I ha- I've seen other students who were trying to do some something or design something, you know, make some cool images or some art or something. And, you know, you, you kind of look like a fool in some sense if you're a beginner and you're just thinking that this looks great and you're following these, you know, these rules that you have about design and you don't you you haven't had a lot of time to develop those skills yet but you you're putting something out there as if it's ready to be critiqued um and that's where I, I definitely felt that like i felt like a fool showing stuff that i thought was dope and then my teacher's like no you know this this ain't it this is not a logo that's going somewhere <laughs> okay you know yeah. all right so how about you john is there a an instance in your life, maybe more recently, where you had to kind of embrace the role of being the fool? Yeah, sure. Earlier this week, um, I found out some more information about like some responsibilities that I'm, I'm going to be taking on like in the future. And uh, there's like a certain piece of equipment that like they asked about. And I personally don't know how to use that piece of equipment. And um, I went... There's a guy who teaches a class that has like a lot of overlapping stuff with me. And he's got a he's got that same piece of equipment that's brand new. And I was like, yo, do you know anything about this? Cause I, I was hoping that he could teach me. Right. Um, because I was like, I don't know, man. And I was trying to figure it out. And it wasn't working. That's why, you know, I was asking him. And turns out he doesn't know anything about the fucking machine either. <laughs> so um, um nice. but it was good though, because I know we're gonna bring it up later, but I ended up sourcing, not sanity, but I ended up sourcing like fucking brain power because now we have two guys trying to figure out how right. to work this machine. Right. Uh, um, and I only got the extra help because I was like, hey man, I don't know how to work this, do you? You know? And mm. I think he was like, you know, like, I don't know how to work it either. I didn't want to ask him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do you guys think, uh, uh, real quick, the, the feeling of being a fool stems from just like that humility? Like you're just like the embarrassment? Mm. Yeah, that's kind of. Like you're embarrassed yeah. almost to say like, hey, I don't know how to use this machine, dude. Like, can you show me how? And then that awkward kind of space is what makes you feel like you're. I think that's, um, I don't know how to word it, but I think that's also, that's, that comes from society though. Because when we're, when we're kids, we love not knowing things. We love like, what's this? What's this? How do you do this? How do you, but as I, the older we get, there's this thing that's put us, put, put on us as like the number of how old we are age. Um, if you're 18 or 19, you should know what to do or mm. how to do it better than you were when you're 12. That's just presumed. That's um, interesting. So if I think, I think the embarrassment comes after you acknowledge, hey, I'm learning. I'm still trying to progress. 
then the embarrassment's like, okay, I understand that I may be embarrassed, but it's a good thing. It's a, it's yeah. A, um, so I don't know. I think that's just my take on it. I think it, it is definitely like a, um, a pressure from society, the, the, the feeling of embarrassment. Cause, but I would say that's a positive, a yeah. positive thing that society does that. Like you should feel, you know, like if you're feeling embarrassed, maybe it's society telling you, Hey, you should learn more stuff, you know, right. like yeah. that's okay. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. that, the little roadblock, the little roadblock is like the back of your head being like, you don't know enough. Don't worry yeah. about it. You know? Yeah. And I'm, I'd be curious to see like what the audience thinks of what they, when they hear the word, you know, fool, like if someone calls you a fool, what, how, what does that make you feel like? Cause the way I grew up learning, like my mom would say, it was like, that person's a fool. You're acting like a fool right now. Just like a straight up idiot. Ignorant. Like you're, it's very yeah. negative. The connotation's yeah. bad, but we're speaking about it in sort of a different light in this video. Yeah. So kind of bringing it back to your, your initial question, you, you said, why do you think people are afraid of being the fool? Right. Right. That's kind of what you asked. So, um, in the subsection, the necessity of equals, uh, JBP says, those well-positioned have used their current competence, their cherished opinions, and their present knowledge, their current skills to stake moral claim to their status. Ooh. In consequence, okay. they have little motivation to admit the error, mm. to learn or change, and plenty of reason not to. And then I've kind of been doing research on the side. It's more of because of what I think, because of my current competence, the cherished opinions I have, I have this position inside a hierarchy. And when you come to me and say, I'm not fully informed, it's not that I'm not okay with learning more. I feel that you've questioned my position oh, inside status. this hierarchy. Right Now I feel that I'm not worthy of the position I hold. Hmm. Interesting. Just, just to spin that, you know, we've, we've established in our last book, Endurance, that like a leader showing that he can, that he can be a fool, that he does know everything, that he acknowledges uh, that he doesn't know everything. Oftentimes, is a sign of like what we think maybe is a good leader. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Just want to throw that back out there. That's good Definitely. correlation right now. Or, or, right, and, and it's you know he says later it's it's necessary and helpful to be and in some ways to remain a beginner. No one unwilling to be a fool a fool. A foolish beginner, excuse me, mm -hmm. can learn. Um, so when bringing things up, maybe like when a boss is talking and they're like, hey, I need to mention to my boss that there's some things that are incorrect in what he brought up. Don't maybe do that publicly. Bring them to the side and also bring solutions, right? Uh -huh. You can tell the person they're wrong, but tell them why. Yeah, it's, okay. how, you, it's how you present the, the wrongful mm -hmm. or the... I guess the the mistake or whatever mm -hmm. or whatever it may be it's how you present it to the person if everybody is leaving the lobby and it's a full group of people and your boss is right there and they obviously did something wrong and you've seen it no one else did and you're like hey look at uh, look right. he did it we all know that you're trying to get a leg up in the mm -hmm. business company whatever like in the group so um i'm not saying that's wrong some people move that in a manner and that's that's just how people move but i think it's identifying how you present that uh, yeah. mistake and how you want mm -hmm. to go about it because i think your boss will respect you more or your employer or your employee or anybody that has a higher uh, uh, a, st a higher status than you in the structure will respect you more because you came to them in private right and they'll, they'll hey thank you for that like right i see that you acknowledged that no one else came to my brought it to mm -hmm. my attention yeah yeah and i mean kind of bringing it back to endurance just like john did is like good leadership requires those people a good company requires those people, right? We, we work as a unit to get a job done, mm -hmm. right? So it is in the way you bring things up. If somebody yeah. went to Ernest Shackleton and was like, hey, you, you messed up publicly in front of the whole group, there's going to be a problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's all in the way you bring things up. It's all yeah. in the way of how you address when you're wrong. There's a lot of different things that can kind of be encapsulated in the, being the fool, right? And how to address when somebody is being a fool. Um, but I wanted to address one more thing before we jump into some questions about it is how does this benefit you? Right? So it is useful. This is all, this is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's quote. It is useful to take your place at the bottom of a hierarchy because it can aid in the development of gratitude and humility, right? Humility he defines as it is better to presume ignorance and invite learning than to assume sufficient knowledge and risk the consequent blindness. Right. So what do you guys think about that quote? What did that make you think about? 
It's better to presume ignorance and invite learning than to assume sufficient knowledge and risk the consequent blindness. Yeah, um, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll, go ahead, I'll John. I'll take it. I'll accept it. You know, like, why not? Seems fair enough. Okay. Seems logical enough for me. Okay. So, I mean, in this sense, it's like, it's the person who willfully puts the blindfold over and is like, I'm correct, right? Versus the person that is willing to take the blindfold off, get a couple scrapes and, and bruises in order to get to the right answer, right? Instead of running into that wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just was, I wanted to kind of talk about that, but a couple of questions about this topic. So first and foremost, what behaviors, traits, or beliefs does one need in order to successfully become the fool? Um, the successful fool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The successful fool in whatever capacity that may look. Um, one thing that I think our behavior trait, um, that Jordan Peterson references a lot is subordination, mm. um, being a subordinate. And I think it's embracing subordination, embracing that you are at the bottom, that you are, you have a boss. Everybody has someone to report to, whether we like it or not. We like, it, even just in free society, we like to think that we have the freedom of unlimited choice, but do we really? We still pay taxes. We still have to show up for work. We still have to pay our bills, pay rent, pay our mortgage. So is it just, can I? Can we just freely roam and say, hey, I'm not doing that because I don't have to. I think we all recognize that there is a level of subordination in all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. And I think the quicker you are to embrace that, the more you are to acknowledge your place in the hierarchy right and the example that he gives is the uh one of the students that approaches him at the restaurant when he's with his family and he says um this guy stopped running from uh um or ceased criticizing what he was doing or him uh doing uh deciding instead to be grateful and seek out whatever opportunities presented themselves right before him um i think the the gratitude with um or on top of subordinating um, embracing that gives you a leg up in life and you acknowledge that this isn't my final destination that right. I, I'm going to do, I'm going to give this 110% and I'm going to keep moving in the best. I'm going to be the best version of dishwasher, best version of, um, car mechanic, best wor version of whatever it may be to mm -hmm. get work. Cause Jordan Peterson talks about this. You can apply all of these morals or ethics or character, uh, character, uh, mannerisms, to every aspect of your life, education, job, mm -hmm. um, family. Um, so how you carry yourself in one aspect of your life is most likely how you're going to carry yourself in another aspect. Okay. So how is something, uh, some way, give me one way somebody can incorporate that or institute it into their, their current way of living. Um, look at your life, re analyze your life, see where you stand right now, financially, mentally, um, family oriented, um, wherever, where, how it's strong or weak, wh wherever you feel like you need to improve, or maybe you just want to get more, you want to get uh, more out of where you're at. Um, analyze that and kind of, uh, sit down with those answers and figure out, do you criticize yourself too harshly? Are you ungrateful for what you, ha what you have? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have clean water to drink? Just analyze everything. And then when you're taking that step back into reality, when you go to, I don't know, say you work at a restaurant and you see, I don't know, let's just say a, a homeless person that's on the side of the world. I think you acknowledge, I do have it good and I can even make it better by my own willpower because I am ahead of a lot of people that don't have as much. Mm. It's that, easier to be gr uh, grateful for things you have than it is to want more of things that you don't know what you want. Mm. You know what I mean? So um, just apply gratitude, um, embrace subordination, and um, s start from where you're at. You know what I mean? There you have so you have limited possibilities. Okay. Sounds Jay, good. Can you can you re-ask me the question? Yeah. So um, what behaviors, traits, or beliefs – does one need in order to successfully become a successful fool? Okay. Yeah. I broke this down in two parts. Okay. One, this is for like the beginner of his journey type person, okay. wherever you are. Um, learn to stay humble. People like someone who's humble. Okay. They want to help you out more. Um, and that's part of like the, like the charm of the fool, you know? Um, 
be hungry too. Humble and hungry is like the part of the charm of the fool. Mm. People are actually like helping the fool out, you know? Right. Um, uh, so you have humility and eagerness or motivated, right? Yeah. And if you keep that, you'll continue to gain knowledge and compound knowledge and earn respect along the way. Mm. Um, the second one, this is for the person who may be already um, established uh, a level of the hierarchy, you know, above the fool, above the beginner. Um, for them, it's don't be afraid to be the fool. Man, that's, that, that, that's not right. Because like, duh, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> don't be afraid, don't be afraid to, to look dumb or ask questions because um, if you don't continue to compound these things, then you'll stay stagnant. You know, mm -hmm. you'll reach a plateau. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't be yeah. afraid to be the fool. Okay. So how would you recommend somebody implement that into their life if they were going to do it right after this episode when they saw it? You know, that's a hard one, Jay. I don't know what someone else is doing right now. But if you're trying to tackle something, you know, I don't... Yeah. That's that's a hard one. Maybe uh, maybe we could answer, answer that like kind of like what Devin said. It, it all it, you got to take inventory of where you're at in your life. Okay. Really, like, it's going to take some high level self awareness. What were you going to say, John? Yeah, because it it all just depends what you're doing. You could yeah. be like a student afraid to try out for a sports team. Like, don't be afraid to be a fool to try out for that. You know, because um, you don't know what you're going to miss out on. You could have like a whole journey of a great experience, but you'll never get that unless you're ready to be a fool or you could be a dude who's like 35 and overweight and you're afraid to look like right. uncool at the gym but like if you don't start now you might miss out on a lifetime of being healthy the rest of your life because mm -hmm. like you're afraid to like look dorky at the gym for like maybe a year or six months or whatever you know mm -hmm. so good, those are good examples i kind of want to say just have thick skin too you know what i mean uh it i i think of the times where i felt humiliated or i felt like a fool and i had to take some pretty harsh critique you know not not even at school but you know relationships um at my first restaurant job i remember this is one time where of my first day i pissed off the manager who was running all the food and he <laughs> yelled at me in front of everybody Ooh. and ever since then you know i i kind of learned all right maybe i shouldn't do that and i i became one of like the i would say like a really good takeout person because you know everybody they critiqued me and they had some shit to say to me when it was high energy, high level, but I didn't react. And, um, Oh, that's a good one. Maybe just being not, not so reactive to people who were criticizing you. Mm -hmm. There's maybe something for you to learn. You're walking into it. Let's say the social institution, right? Cause we're talking about a social that do not denigrate social institutions carelessly or creative achievement in this, in this rule, understanding that the social institution exists for a reason there's a you start doing this maybe it's your host and then you move to takeout and then food running and then you become a server and then you can become a something manager and then you can become something like that and that system is there for a reason so take understanding have thick skin and um yeah that, that all ties into subordination i think we covered that pretty well okay yeah. right yeah definitely um so for me i would say it's, it's a tough one. I think gratitude is a big part of it, right? Yeah, definitely. Accepting being the fool means you kind of have to be grateful for the people that are t trying to teach you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in my own experience, being in grad school, I'm working with uh, John Wakabayashi. If you haven't seen it, go check out the interview. Uh, and you'll understand idea. what I'm talking about. The man has the force it's like trying to ask somebody <laughs> in, in star wars that's a jedi to explain it to you it's not something that can just be explained in one sentence one paragraph or even one chapter of a book you have to read multiple books and you have to do it you have to just kind of do it but i'm so grateful to have somebody that um, is willing to walk th with me through that journey right or at least be on the side of it and be like hey you're going the wrong way right being grateful that people ahead of you or people that might know something that you don't plays a big role in that. Mm -hmm. I would say having gratitude that I don't know everything, and but there is somebody that does. Yeah. And I can learn from that. I think that's a big part of it. And then being, you know, passionate and patient, right? In the principles by Ray DeLeo, he has um, a five-step process, right? Where he has... Step four is process, 
right? You make That's a right. mistake, you, you're running, you make a mistake, you fall, you process what's going on, you change your path and you keep moving, right? Being passionate and having patience kind of, I think, falls into that process processing stage where it's like, okay, I made the mistake. I have passion that I want to learn what I can do to improve going forward on that path and patience with myself to understand that it's not going to happen overnight. Hmm. Right. Right. So these two kind of go hand in hand in the sense that you have to be passionate in what you want to learn and what you want to become better at and then be patient in understanding that it's not going to happen in the blink of an eye. It's going to take continual trial and error, trial and error. And um, so I would say that those those two uh, for me would be probably the biggest or one of the biggest ones to apl apply you moving forward. Patience on there. Yeah. I can't remember who in my life told me, but they said that that saying, you know, practice makes perfect is not, it's, it should be patience makes perfect. Mm. That's what that makes me think of is your patience with all the mistake mistakes you're making or whatnot. The willingness to learn. I heard <laughs> every time I hear that practice makes perfect. I always think of this. I can't remember exactly what they said, but it was, um, practice just makes for more practice yeah, somebody up. hearing that they're like, uh, <laughs> like you know I mean? <laughs> all right so one last question on this topic and we'll move on to the next one who do you guys think could benefit from incorporating this everybody everybody in the world everybody in the world okay let's be specific let's though, be real specific if it's everybody it's nobody well who would uh, the real question is who would you who could you see not benefiting from this I said anybody 18 and up. Um, I, I'm talking with DJ. I, I, I took away the top part. I say 18 and up is because you got to have a certain amount of emotional maturity to even mm -hmm. fucking read this book, man. Like, yeah. sometimes I think I'm too dumb to read this book. You know, like, it's it's like a lot to unpack. You're a fool. So, <laughs> we are the fools. <laughs> um, so, I feel like there's, there's no point to, to this book for the people who can't like they're still doing other stuff you know yeah, can't cover but, yeah but adults young adults to adults you could be 80 years old and you could be like i could start doing wordle with the grandkids and that'd be something new you know okay so i want to i want to bring it back dev because you said who wouldn't benefit from it mm -hmm. i think that that's a good point but there's a point in somebody's life that they can benefit from it then more if you're than thinking somebody. everybody can benefit mm -hmm. from it when in their particular life just give me one example then where they could benefit from it okay um so one talking about the awareness part that john's kind of um, acknowledging yes and when i in the sense when i say everyone i mean everybody that's capable of comprehending intellectual information okay that can sit and read or sit and dissect information if you're aware of what you're consuming that's up to your own willpower your own your own capabilities of, of intellect but to incorporate to us like say to a specific person i think it's someone um that's willing to be patient with themselves reanalyze their current situation when they do reanalyze their current situation they are aware of where their mistake mistakes and um um, downfalls are happening if they are aware of everything already then that's a great person that that's a this is who should be reading this information okay. because if you're already looking for that if you're seeking that self-improvement already don't get airheaded don't get big-headed because you think you know everything and i'm already there i'm already mm -hmm. doing this i'm already positioned in my life where i need to be well, that's, that's great, but what, what happens when you get to the finish line and you own whatever you want to own, you have whatever you want to have, do you just stop and, and is that it? Hmm. Or do you continue to learn and continue to look for the new innovative ways to find that 20-year-old, 18-year-old person that was always looking to self-improve hmm. and how do you maintain that? Okay. So mm -hmm. I think that's the person that's the person that's looking for self improvement all the time. The person that's looking for self improvement all the time. Boom. Okay. That's a good. That's yeah, right. that's a good way to put it. I would say someone who could benefit, right? Who who are, who's the person that could benefit from incorporating this yeah. idea of being the fool? Um, maybe if you find yourself criticizing things pretty harshly, and I know that's going to take some self awareness, but you know, I, I think of the person who's always blaming the social institution for what it is and not mm. taking the the uh, proactive mindset to be like, okay, well, what can I do to 
uh, well, for one, you know, show gratitude for where you're at, for those watching, you know, if you're, if you're in that situation, I think you can show gratitude. And if you find yourself in a, maybe a victim mindset, you know, like someone who's, you know, like, like I said, blaming the social institution for what it is rather not, rather than not appreciating it for what the greater good is or what, what it's doing for the greater good for the company that you may be working at for the relationship with your family that you have, uh, maybe your job, um, you know, for, for what it is right now in this, in this moment and take those next steps to, to harness that humility and, and see where these ideas could actually benefit you. Mm -hmm. I'd say if you're finding yourself cr criticizing things pretty harshly, maybe you could try this out. Try this idea out. Be the fool. Be willing to do that. Show gratitude. Understand your place and your subordination into the, what you're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, what do you think, Jay? I think, you know, you, you hit it pretty well. I think uh, this would be really beneficial for people who are just entering the world of hierarchies, whether that's a new job, you're going to undergraduate school, graduate school, adults that are entering a new hierarchy, right? You just started a new job where you need to figure out where I fit in, how can I improve and, and how can I move up in this, in this hierarchy? I think those people, um, you know, hierarchy is kind of this vague term, but it's, it's like, it could be a bunch of different things, social, it could be a job, it could be a bunch of different things, but, um, right. If you want to learn how to improve, you need to understand where you are. And you need to understand what you need to learn in order to improve. Yeah. Right. And in order to do that, you have to accept that you don't know everything. And so that's where you accept being the fool. Okay. I don't know. How can I know? And how can I use it to improve my position in this, in this hierarchy, my life's position, any of that, right? Mm -hmm. Understand where you are. Use the fool to understand, use the, the, what, what would you call that? The, the, what the, is it? The fool. The use that. Use the idea of being the, the fool, concept. The yeah. concept in order to accept where you are and to learn where you need to go. Right. And that's what I was. The say. benefits too is is that you could potentially get noticed by your higher ups, right? That maybe you're critiquing all or you're criticizing all the time, and then they'll start to take notice of the hard work you're putting in, and then more doors will open. Uh, that's that's what I had kind of written down, and you know, you're you're part of something bigger than yourself and you'll have more opportunity practicing this mindset and showing gratitude and humility. I think those are the two things that they got to do. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think uh, why I said a person that's always self-improving, um, cause I know our notes, um, say like young adults and adults that are moving into newer hierarchies. Um, because I think even when you're out, cause Jordan Peterson covers it, but our focus is just the fool. We're not talking about the necessity of equals or even the top dogs. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people that are barely entering the hierarchy structure of whatever sense, if it's a company, business, um, a family, whatever sense of orientation that we're thinking about. But if, if you do, I think where I was thinking, where my mind was at with that question was like, when you do enter that new spot, eventually you're going to move up if you don't have that i guess that condescending mind of what your superior should look like like how david was saying like you're always criticizing and never taking the critique you're never mm. being accountable um if you i think inevitably everybody should progressively move up through life once you are progressively moving up i think i said a said a little bit about it um and when i was talking about the self-improvement individual self-improving individual is don't get don't let your ego destroy your character is when jordan peterson talks about the necessity of equals can you identify other people that are equal to you on that uh, status of hierarchy are you someone that acts like you know everything but realistically when someone corrects you you get you let you react you don't you don't respond yeah. well to someone mm -hmm. giving you criticism because you think you like what you said earlier everything that you've built puts you in this status quo right when someone questions that you feel attacked threatened I'm so ready. you go mm -hmm. up on the the defense or the offense right. and you feel you, you you have a sense to react somewhat negatively i think where my mind was at and when that question was you I, at any point at every stage in life you're always going to have to double back and hit that process like Ray Dalio and stumble and fall and fall back into the fool. Mm -hmm. 
at every stage. I think once you lose sight of being the fool, you lost sight of your own goals and yeah. admiration. And that's when you get old. Yeah, that's when you get yeah, old. That's when you get old. That's, that's when, when you life, stop learning. <laughs> that's when life hits you. Yeah. So I'm going to say, drop something down in the comments down below. What do you think? How, who can benefit from this? How are you incorporating this in your life? How is it benefiting you? We want to know because we want to learn too right? We're not coming from the all-knowing side. Yeah, yeah. We don't know either, right? We accept that we're fools and we want to learn more. So you guys go ahead and teach us. What do you think? Drop that down in the comment below. Before we move topics, I'm going to open up the door for any last comments on the fool. I think we covered it. I just want to hear the audience's fool stories, man. Yeah. Everybody's got a story. Yeah. <laughs> you have a story you want to share? A fool story. Being mm -hmm. the fool? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that restaurant one was... Okay. Pretty, was pretty good. gnar, man. I yeah. thought for sure I was getting fired the first day, <laughs> you know, but yeah. I think it's cool because I, I grow, I grew to get respected by people by putting in the hard work and yeah. not letting that get to me. And I, I think John had mentioned one time when he was, you know, a dishwasher it was his first job, um, you know, and then John gained some respect from the, the higher ups and they're like, Hey, he's not you know, like some manager like a, or a server or something yet, but he's putting in the work. Like you guys need to listen to him because right. he has something to say. Mm -hmm. Right, John? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have, a, I have a, a story too from my undergraduate experience. People used to be afraid of being the fool, right? In the sense that I don't want to go ask the teacher. I, I feel like I've asked him too many questions, right? I'll be like, okay, here's what we're going to do. I grab a piece of paper out and I'm like, we're going to write all these questions down and I'll go ask him. I don't care if I look stupid. That alone set me apart from the my cohort meaning my class that i was with as somebody who wants to know right yep. and didn't care about looking dumb because of that because of that very um paradigm of understanding that i can be the fool and because of it i'm going to become better i got letters of recommendation from all the all the <laughs> teachers from my department i got into grad school i got an advisor that i wanted um People are writing me letter, letters of recommendation to do scholarships because of just embracing that in one part of my life. It applied into future things that I'm doing. So that's that's one that I would do. So I highly recommend doing it. Pick Go it up. On. Yeah. I just want to say something because this is like the third time that you guys have said this. So I just want to clarify to the listeners and you guys. We keep putting in like if you are the fool, like it's going to lead to success. But like. It, that only happens if you have like the work ethic behind being a fool mm -hmm, because yeah. if you stay a fool then you're just a fool you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah. so yeah. being yeah. a fool isn't like the end all be all like the work ethic from like your other stuff like how many hours do you put in to it like the whole goal is to not be a fool so there's it's a whole, okay to <laughs> uh, i was just gonna say so you're saying that the work ethic is equally as important if not very 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 important yeah it's it's almost more important. Like Crucial. being the fool is like, is like, is like the search bar, like right. the cursor. You're like, Oh, new, you know, new quest on, on, you know, new quest found. <laughs> it's like, if you don't go do the quest and you're just a fucking guy who hasn't done it yet, you know, you didn't learn anything. <laughs> right. So yeah. I want to highlight, I want to highlight work ethic is very important. Uh, it, it's agreed. actually what makes it happen. Agreed. Comment down in this comment section below how many times the word fool was said. I want you guys to count that. Full. Full, 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 full. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All, All right. right. Next topic. Next topic. So another a big overarching topic that he brings up in chapter one is the idea that we outsource our sanity. Ooh, what right? does that mean? So that means people depend on constant communication with others to keep their minds organized. We all need to think to keep things straight, but we mostly think by talking. People mm -hmm. remain mentally healthy, not merely because of the integrity of their own minds, but because they are constantly being reminded of how to think, act, and speak by those around them. Okay, so he has a long list of reasons what we need to do in order to organize our mind, but it kind of boils down to people are social beings, and there is no shortage of wisdom and guidance around us embedded in the social world. Um, we need to talk both to remember and to forget. So one of the big questions that I have about this topic is, um, you know, why, what does it mean to outsource your sanity? What does that mean as a whole? Outsource your sanity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think the way it's described, right. Is like, it's like you said, we're, we're, we, we think 
as we speak and we sort of are in a part of this like social contract between people to to kind of remind us of how to speak think and act sort mm -hmm. of shapes our behavior and we outsource that on other people to stay sane okay to conduct ourselves yeah mm -hmm. okay so um you know how can people benefit from maybe having the correct cr crowd or how how can it be a problem to have the wrong crowd to outsource to what mm. go ahead john are you gonna say something i just want to make an example to like the people who maybe it's not clear exactly what it is is like in the same way we outsource information where we use google and we don't know what we're doing go google it mm -hmm. google's like we're outsourcing our knowledge uh when we ask a question you know when like you play like a thinking game with friends you outsource their brains you're like quantum computing with brains okay um mm -hmm. the same thing could be applied to like your emotional your mental aspect of stuff yeah. So if you have people that are constantly, let's say like the, you know, half, half empty type of people, just to, you know, call it a thing. Um, maybe you're always going to be cynical and look at stuff through an upside down lens. But right. if you surround yourself with, let's say just positive people, and this is just one example, maybe you see things through like a half full lens. And that's only because like, you can't help, but get the same energy that, that, you, that you're around, you know, mm -hmm. right. that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who, who's heard the thing that, who's heard the, the saying that you are a product of your five closest friends Yeah, I've all heard or that's your five idea. closest yeah. relationships. Mm -hmm. That's my space, baby. Who's in my top five? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. That's a flashback. <laughs> I, Yo, I, I, I went to your profile. Friends. I went to your profile and I'm not in your top five. What's that about? You tell right. me I can't outsource my sanity to you or what? Yeah. Like what's going on? You're in my top five. Like, don't make me look like that. Like, yeah. People see that shit. They see I'm not in yours. Like, I don't want to yeah. be that guy. I don't want to be that guy, dude. Definitely. So if you look at those, you go to that MySpace page, everybody's like, I look at Dev, I look at De David, I look at John. And I'm like, well, who are their five closest people? If I look at these five closest people, I'm sure I can find traits, behaviors, habits that John exhibits that one of these five people, if not more of most of them to all of them exhibit that same habit, trait, or behavior. Mm. Because of that, it's important to understand the people around you because whether we believe it or not, you outsource your behaviors, your habits, <clears throat> your, the way you act, your, the way you talk to the people around you, right? If I say something, that doesn't mesh with this group, this group will be, hey, you know, that that's not, that's not okay. But it might be okay to a different group. So it's- That a, wasn't very woke of you, Jay. Rethink that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's important, to, it's important to, <laughs> that I would say it's very important to understand who you're outsourcing your sanity to. Not to say you can't have different groups of friends, but understand that you're gonna be getting competing ideas oh, from yeah, different absolutely. groups right absolutely so if you're hanging out with people that just want to do the bare minimum don't be surprised that when you do try to do more than the bare minimum they're going to try and bring you right back down crabs in a barrel bucket mentality in other words you're a product of your your environment you know, right people you surround yourself with. yeah so you with five bums you're going to be a six yeah exactly sure. you're, you're number six so you know then the question arises if we do outsource the problem of our sanity to the interpersonal relationships around us, how do we use discernment to choose these relationships wisely? Okay. Um, for me, I really want to take this. For me, and it's you get that from the first part of this chapter, which was my favorite, but it's the value of pointing. Mm. And it's all about finding out what's valuable. You know? Oh, that's a good one. And you can be what I think different communities are different, different countries are different. Mm. But if you find out what's valuable in your community, then you would surround yourself with a team to be good at that thing, you know? Yeah. And I think early in the book, it references the whole goal in life is to not win the game, but to be on the team that's playing the most. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> to play the most amount of games. Play the most amount of games. So, like, you got to find out what's the thing that's valuable and build a team to do that thing and, and keep trying to do that thing, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, would you say it's important then to evaluate the group as a whole what's valuable or understand what's valuable to you and find people that mm. it coexists between all of them the later because i don't think everyone has to have like the same goal if actually it might be bad because like there might, might there might not be enough for me you know okay yeah. but if you have overlapping things like we can have a 
like you know team effort symbiotic you know what i'm right. saying okay. a, a natural relationship yes yeah, yeah. that's yeah one. i think i i agree 100 percent with john i think like to identify or how do you discern groups that you should be around and you shouldn't be around what do you want in life where do you want to land if you can't identify that then how do you how do you discern anything at all ever yeah you know what I mean? Like you have to have a destination. You have to have a finish line. That, not saying that, the, that that's the end goal, but that, that that's a step. That's a that's a part of the process. Once you hit that finish line, what's your next finish line? What's your next one after that? And I'm not saying you have to know 10 years, 20 years into the future, but if you don't have, if you're not aiming at anything, you're going to ceaselessly and endlessly, endlessly walk into an abyss of dark abyss of darkness you're just going to keep going Aimless. into nothing yeah darkness. so find bum, something bum, bum. to aim at find something to hit find a target and, and then what you guys said don't just associate with people that have the same goal as you because if they're trying to attack the same thing you want that creates competition just mm -hmm. align yourself with the people that have which is same. good competition is good actually jay and i was talking about this uh, earlier on a different topic but Mm, yeah, um, it is. It, 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 I think all of us know competition is definitely yeah. going to bring not only empowerment to us as individuals, but as a group, you'll see the levels of like how far you're willing to push yourself when yeah. someone else wants it as bad as, bad as you. Mm -hmm. But then, um, like also with competition, like maybe the people don't want to help you because like you're in direct conflict mm -hmm. with their best interests. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so yeah, I Which think I think fair. that's just find a, find a purpose or not a purpose but find your direction first mm. then you can discern who can be in the car with you to stay in your lane who can be on your journey with you because not everybody's fit for your journey right. you know some I mean? people driving a coupe some driving a bus yeah gotta, so <laughs> just just find where you fit in i think that brings us to and I'm, i want to ask you for yours too but i i think this has brought us to a point where okay we need to understand what's valuable right and then we need to find people that also hold that in value, mm -hmm. right? But that takes self-awareness. That's the second time that that's been said in this, this episode, right? right? How do people build self-awareness to be able to understand what's valuable to them? How do you build self-awareness? See, dude, that's why it's my favorite part of the book. The, the pointy part to me is like the, the best part of this book because you find out what's valuable, like at a young age. And I think it's a little bit of like nurture versus nature where like parents who like spend a lot of time with their kids, teach them like, like what, what is important that they teach them values. Right. Um, you learn that pretty fast. So I, you know, I, I guess it's a lot of it's where you come from. So if you don't come from parents who maybe were like more nurturing, like you have to learn that later in life, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but, um, and I, and I guess in that fact, you find your, like you find role models, but okay. the whole thing is like, the pointy thing is from a young age, you figure out what is valuable, you know? Right. Yeah. And so John's the, referring to a, point, a part in the book where it's called the point of pointing. Right. You know, it's a good section. So you, you believe what's valuable to someone on a hundred percent of the time is subjective or individualistic. I would, I would say subjective. Like for example, like my parents, like whether, whether I like I have control over or not, I grew up like with certain like principles and morals that I, I was taught, you know? Okay. And like in other communities, um, like they have those things. You know, I was listening to a podcast about Asian Americans in California and like their, like how much they strive for education and stuff. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's part of like their family culture and my family, right. that wasn't one of the big things in our household was like having to get A's. Like we were happy if I was passing and just okay. nothing wrong. It just wasn't one of their things, but yeah, there's a reason why like there's like a high number of Asian Americans success rate in college because right. like that's one of their family morals. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That's a really, so, that's a really good point. Yeah. Because you need to find out first what's valuable <clears throat> in order to under discern if these people follow the same code of ethics yeah. that I have. Right. You know, just kind of one more thing in a small community, you know, you talked about, um, like, I just want to give example you've talked about Sanger before, you know, okay. um, in the little town of Sanger, what's valuable might not be like an actual big thing, but to them, it's valuable for them living in Sanger, like yeah. on, in, on their social life. But like, maybe what you want more is like a life outside of that, you know? So yeah. like, your goal point over there. You just have a different map though. And like, why do you have that? Is it because your parents? Like, I don't know, you know? Mm. 
you know, that brings up a good point too, because it's scalable, right? We said mm. <clears throat> you are a culmination of your five closest people, mm. right? That's scalable as well, right? You can be like, okay, well, these five people are important to me. Okay, well, what's important to the city of Sanger? Okay, well, what's mm. important to the county of Fresno? Okay, well, then what's important to the state of California, United States? It's scalable true in a regard um so <clears throat> yeah i would say definitely it you can identify with people in a sense that it doesn't just have to be the people that you're close to yeah right? would, would finding the sense of awareness come after you're able to identify and point where your direction is it gives you a stronger sense of awareness where you need to be can you repeat that because your question to john was how do you develop a sense of awareness and yeah. john sort of answered that um, so I think just to simplify or summarize, the answer would be like you, in a sense, would have to find your values and your morals or your principles mm -hmm. in order to find your stronger self or stronger sense of awareness mm -hmm. in your place in society. Um, if it's your mom, or your parent, the nurture guiding you, or if it's just nature having to, to work its way, its wits around you, yeah. um, you have to find that for yourself. But, okay. um, is I think that's a, that's a good way of looking at how to develop awareness. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like s start by pointing where, what direction are you going to point in? Go down that path and pick up awareness as you're going down that path. Right. You'll have some sense of awareness. We're all conscious beings. You know right. what I mean? Like, but that's not, we're talking about very specific awareness. We're about, we're talking about, are you socially aware of who's around you and can you discern if they're good or bad? That's mm. a very specific awareness. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. All right. I want to extend that question to you, David. If we outsource the problem of our sanity to the interpersonal relationships around us, how do we use discernment to choose these relationships wisely? If you don't have anything else to add to that, that's fine. But I wanted you to have the opportunity. Yeah, you guys killed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, I guess I can answer to the self-awareness thing because that's what I was thinking about the most. You know, how do I become self-aware? What does it mean to be self-aware? And I always think about that. Uh, I think it was the second habit and seven habits of highly effective people. How do you want to be remembered? Mm, um, yeah. You know, yep. on your, your funeral, funeral, right? What are people going to say about you? What did you stand for? And how do you want, if you want that outcome, Right, whatever you're thinking of right now, give a second or two to think about what you want to be remembered for. What can you do now to to act on that and and become self aware in that manner? And I think you can become self aware by knowing your end goal and start. What is it? Starting with the end in yeah, mind. End in mind. Yeah. Starting with the end in <clears throat> mind, and then work your way back and maybe assess. You know, take inventory and keep that in mind while you're finding what the value is of the people closest around you is what, what value do you have right now? How do you want to be remembered mm. and compare those two? Maybe I should point to something else that's valuable or something. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. He says in there too, um, <laughs> you're going to have four people talk at your funeral, right? One is a friend, one is family, one is a coworker and one is somebody that was part of a community like church. Yeah. What do you want them to say to you about your funeral? And by doing that exercise, you get to understand the underlying principles and morals that are important to you. That's a deep one. I think everybody's path to becoming self-aware is like, you know, there's things that can help for me or, or just, that was specific to us, but yours might be different. You might find yourself aware after hitting rock bottom or something. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? That's where, yeah. you know, definitely uh, drink every day, smoke weed. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. YouTube, we don't mean that. We don't mean that. We don't mean that. All right. All right. I have another question then. And we'll start with you, David. With mental health being highlighted so much in today's society, why do you think people struggle with it so much? With what are they outsourcing their mental health slash sanity to? Okay. Say it again. Okay. With mental health being highlighted in today's society, mm -hmm. why do you think people struggle with it so much? Meaning, what are they outsourcing their mental health slash sanity to? <clears throat> I think that question can stem from people outsourcing their sanity to maybe some of the things that we already kind of mentioned, you know, okay. the circles that aren't, it's it like they, they're not getting a, a sense of fulfillment or a sense of critique or friends that call them out on 
what their values are, where they're going. They don't have like a, a good sense of counsel. And so mental okay. health becomes a problem because they don't have that in their lives. I mean, before we started this, I can just speak from, for what, what I experienced was, I think my mental health was not so hot, but it became way better after I found you guys to sort of counsel with and outsource that too you know, what I was dealing with. I got another perspective, another paradigm. Uh, can you think about it this way? Um, emotional, like the social emotional aspect was uh, increased for me when I when I was able to share those ideas with you. And then maybe the mental health, I think it gave me a, a stronger sense of uh, control over that. You know, I wasn't struggling with it so much at that point yeah. anymore. Okay. Because I was able to outsource it on you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I see what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, I think for my answer would just be if uh, mental health is highlighted, um, if it's being highlighted a lot in, in a lot in today's society, um, if you're outsourcing your sanity to, let's say, social media, um, the only reason why mental health is being highlighted so much is because social media isn't a good outlet for your sanity. Um right. You have to find, like going back to what we just said, find people that you can discern good and bad to your own correlation or where you want to end up in life. There's millions and billions of people on social media that are judging and criticizing you for not knowing who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. So why are you listening to these people? So if people aren't aware of their own self-confidence or don't know where they want to end up in life, they're letting other people that have never met them, never seen them, judge and bully or critique them and they're taking it to the heart and not truly understanding their own self-worth within themselves okay so they let other people give them value outside of their own mm, that's interesting discernment group so i think mental health is highlighted because there's a lot of people that haven't developed that awareness that we just talked about mm. so so why do you think people put so much weight behind say a social media website um whether it's hey. negative or positive um, in far in Scared in me. what context? What do you mean? So I I have an idea. I put it up on Twitter. Is this good or bad? Because I what I'm doing is I'm outsourcing my sanity to Twitter, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. I'm waiting for a response back from Twitter, whether it be a person from all the way across the world or my close circle. Why Just, do people put so much weight on that? I think it's my Johnny can go right now, but I think in simple terms, you know your true intentions, and people will lie and and cut and sugarcoat their true intentions on why they post things. We've seen that over and over and over again. So the person that's posting it knows their true intentions. Everybody else is kind of just reacting or responding to how they feel about what you're putting out. They don't know your intention. They don't know why you put it out. They're just reacting based on what they believe what the reason why they think you put it out um and why they're reacting to it if it's negative or bad um as far as context wise we don't know but if it's a bad context it may not be in your favor to even respond to something that is making you think negatively okay but social media gets that kind of triggers out of people and i think that's why mental health is such a detriment in the space of social media Okay. See the last sentence you said, um, social media gets a trigger out of, gets such a big trigger out of people. And I'll extend the question to John. Why do you think that is? Um, okay. Actually that was perfect. <laughs> I just think it's a numbers game, you know, like I live in a town that's got like, I fucking forget now. I want to say like 35,000 people. I don't know. Okay. Um, I can go online and connect to, trillions of people yeah like of course maybe like the numbers game i'm getting more negative um than i'm that i'm supposed to get but i'm also probably getting more positive too so like i think social media can be a great thing i think it can can i think it has a potential to connect you with people all around the world and like if you choose to spread love and the surround people surround yourself with people who want to spread love then it can be a positive thing i just mm -hmm. think like people don't in the same way you, you choose the group you want to be with you can do the same thing on, on the internet you know like yeah well my dad what my dad talks about with his internet stuff is like all I love he talks about like baking bread with russians and like you know it's <laughs> yeah. fucking crazy but he just <laughs> he's not plugged into like normal things right, that's yeah. what I'm so yeah. um I, I think that's it it's applicable to your social life okay. to answer your first question about why do you think mental health is more of an issue now? I think that the decay or the decline of like local community 
organizations has something to do with it. Um, I think even pre COVID, but really pre pre internet, there was more like um, block parties where like, at least in my area, like neighborhoods would get together and like eat food. And all the kids around the same age group would all hang out and parents kind of all in the same ballpark would like kick back and like hang out. Yeah. Um, I don't know you guys. I never see that. Shit I mean, I you never know? see that anymore. No. That's crazy. Uh, it's um, very rare. Yeah. So like, not like you're, you're not even outsourcing to your local community. Of course you have mental health issues. You know, you're not talking to people like you used to. And you know, like them brought up, if your only interactions are bad on social media, I mean, this that's not a good cycle. Right. Um, yeah. Because I think more than often than not, when I meet people in person, most interactions are nice. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. So, people, are, but, people aren't themselves on the internet. Dads aren't going to the bowling alleys anymore. Aren't going to the bowling alleys anymore. Kids aren't going to fucking Chuck E. Cheese with all their friends. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, all of that stuff's gone. So, They're playing I think that's a big reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know... I think too, one thing to remember is if you're outsourcing your, your sanity or you want to know what people think and you're going to the internet for that, people are not themselves behind the screen, right? You mm-hmm. become this internet persona and you kind of gear all your interactions through that lens, yeah, right? Definitely. My lens here in, in real life is going to be different than my lens when I don't have any repercussions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I can be a complete asshole on Twitter and I'm not going to have any repercussions for that, but you do that in, in person, you're going to get checked. Yeah. Instantly. Right? instantly. So, and, and it's going to get checked whether it's, it doesn't have to be violent. You're just going to be like, Hey bro, like you don't have to be an asshole, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're outsourcing to people that aren't even themselves. So, and you don't even know if there's like a real person on the other side, but because you hear that ding, you check it. There's a dopamine rush. Oh, okay. This is what this person said. And you hear ding, ding, ding all day. That's you're, you're getting conditioned to believe that this is a real person or this is somebody's opinion that I got to listen to. Right. Yeah. Don't outsource your sanity to people that you don't even know what their values are. Yeah. I think one good point that John brought up, um, uh, just social media, social media in in the creation of social media was supposed to be a positive and, and a thing for humanity. Um, uh, I guess connection and communication for people, just in general to connect around the world. Um, but I just listened to a podcast with Mark Zuckerberg and he talks about like having to deal with all the criticism being the most hated tech. Um, the Lex Friedman one. Yeah. Yeah. The Lex Friedman one. I I listened to it too. Yeah. Being the most hated, um, tech CEO and some of the things he was talking about, like I, to, in a sense, like he seems like a real genuine, like real down to earth guy, but he's faced with all these real hard, real life problems and no one really has the answers to, but what back to in the, the sense of, um, what John kind of tapped onto, uh, tapped into was social media can be a positive thing. Um, I think what Facebook did to to respond to people that were getting a lot of bullying, a lot of criticism, a lot of stuff they didn't want to hear, they instead of blocking people because it was hard to justify how hard to identify what bullying is compared to let's say terrorism. Right, terrorism carries itself in a very specific manner. There's there's a, a, a you can identify people that carry themselves. So let's say like a. a I don't know, like a fucking arsonist group or something, right? They have a certain logo, they say certain things, but bullying is so different and so um, it's not so identifiable. So instead of anybody that's saying fat on the internet, let's just ban them. What Facebook did was give the ability to the person that is putting out the content to block whoever you don't want to see. You can block the person that is bullying you and not notify them that you blocked them. So if it's causing you harm of any sense, Facebook's is not. Facebook has given the ability to block them or stop them from seeing your content. So, it, in a sense, they're trying to give the power back to the creator. So to, there is to some things up. Tyler Creator said, "I don't understand cyberbullying. Get off the fucking computer." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Straight up. Straight up. Yeah. Um. So there's some tools that uh, Dr. Peterson offers when discussing outsourcing sanity, and he he comes up with these questions that he asked for his new clients when he was, was in, when he was a clinician, um, as a psychologist. So he, he had these lists of questions, uh, to identify if somebody was outsourcing their sanity correctly, or if they were heading down kind of like a, a downward spiral. Mm. And so these questions were, and these will be to ask yourself, have I been educated to the level of my intellectual ability or ambition? 
Is my use of free time engaging, meaningful, and productive? Have I formulated solid and well-articulated plans for the future? Am I and those I am close to free of any serious physical health or economic problems? Do I have friends in a social life? A stable and st uh, satisfying intimate partnership? Close and functional familial relationships? A career or at least a job that is financially sufficient, stable, and if possible, a source of satisfaction and opportunity? If the answer to any three or more of these questions is no, we may be insufficiently embedded in the interpersonal world and in danger of spiraling downward psychologically because of that. Mm. So he offers these questions as this is what he wants to check for when somebody comes into his private practice as a clinician. That's right? what I was going to ask. This came after when he sat down with the girl and she kind of just pivoted into this right. wild left way of left, thinking. Yeah she, yeah, she went way <laughs> off the board, right? And so take some time. And, and if you feel like maybe, you know, I, I something's going on, something's going on, I can't identify it. Ask yourself these questions and answer them, right? Yep. You know, then you can kind of identify, well, here, maybe this is where the problem is coming from. If you're having trouble understanding or trying to identify where I'm getting this kind of either anxiety or, um, you know, sense of not doing something right. I'm not, uh, pursuing what I'm supposed to be pursuing. Try and understand maybe through these questions, these might just be some of the few that you can ask yourself, but try and understand and use these questions to, to pinpoint where maybe this anxiety is coming from. Hmm. Right. So um, we're going to encourage you to drop a comment down below. How are you outsourcing your sanity? Mm -hmm. um, how do you discern what group of people? How are you? How are you uh, finding out what's valuable to them hmm. in order to make sure that they're in tune with what you want to do? Um, so one last thing I wanted to mention here. We want to bring to you why, you know, so why does Dr. Peterson mention this? And more importantly, why are we bringing this to you, the viewer? Right. So I have written down here because we cannot underestimate the importance of the company we keep. They validate what is important and how we should act, think and communicate. And because of that, it is important to understand the people we are outsourcing our sanity to. So take the time today to look around you and within yourself to understand what's important and how you're getting validation and outsourcing that to your community around you. Anything else you guys want to add? No. No, nope. you killed it, man. Yeah. Nope. Okay. Smart. I'm going to take us out. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Paradigm Podcast. We are reading a new book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. Go pick it up. Go pick it up. It's a really good book. The first one was good. If you don't know anything about the first one, go pick this one up to get you into it. Before you take off, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Drop a like down below. Comment to any of those questions we ask you guys throughout the video down below. And all the information to follow us on, you know, we got a Instagram. We got a Spotify. We got... We're on YouTube. You obviously. We got the, the OnlyFans. Fuck it. We We're on Pornhub, fans. buddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come find us, man. Come communicate with us. We want to. We want to get to know you guys. So, go ahead and follow us on all our social media platforms. All the information will be down in the link below. Before we take off, we want to remind you. Let them know. Now equals tomorrow. Peace.